stopped. We had just finished talking about the United States and Woodrow Wilson declaring, asking Congress for a declaration of war on the basis of, you know, unrestricted German U-boat warfare, you know, blowing up American merchant vessels. The discovery of the Zimmerman note, you remember the Zimmerman note, where Germany is instigating Mexico to attack the United States to draw us into World War One, and also with the with the downfall of the Russian monarchy, it becomes a it becomes more palatable or acceptable to the American people because it could be a fight of democracy versus monarchy. Okay, so the United States declares war. But at the time the United States does declare war, right. it's snowing. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. it's wonderful. Happy March twenty, April twenty first. <laughs> um. So, the, but the United States was totally unprepared for war. Um, about how many people do you think the United States had enlisted in the entire United States military? Army, Navy, Marines. The entire United States military. How many soldiers do you think we had? You might want to take a guess. 5,200. 5,200? 100,000. About 200,000. 200,000 men were in service when war was declared. Very few of our officers had any kind of combat experience. So drastic measures were really needed in order to modern our, modernize our army to make any kind of impact against these battle-hardened veterans of the Axis or um, Central Powers. So first thing we got to do is we got to have more soldiers. And so to meet the government's need for more fighting power, Congress passes what's known as the Selective Service Act in May of 1917. Do you guys know what the Selective Service Act is and does to this very day? It is the draft, and it exists today. Let's see. Austin, how old are you? 16. In the next couple years, you have to register with the Selective Service Act. Ladies, you do not. You're not required. But all men, by law, have to register with selective services. You do so at sss.gov. Now, at this time, there was no sss.gov. It was done through, I think, voting registration. But what the Selective Service Act does is it, requ it requires men to register. You have to register. Just because you register does not mean you're joining the military. I am registered with the Selective Services. Every man, for the most part in America, is registered with the Selective Services. By the end of 1918, about 24 million men had registered with the Selective Service. If you do not register with the Selective Services nowadays, you can't get things like um, <clears throat> scholarships, you can't go to public institutions, you can't get a federal job. There's a lot of things that they can do to make your life as an American more inconvenient. Withhold your tax return. So you need to do that. Of the 24 million men registered, 3 million were drafted. Meaning conscripted into military service. You gotta go. Of those three million, two million reached Europe on made it to Europe. Of those two million, one point seven five million saw combat. So about almost 2 million Americans were war veterans, like straight up saw combat in the trenches, war veterans of World War I. Most of the inductees were not your upper classes of society. 
Many of them did not even attend high school. About one in five were foreign born, not even born in America. They were immigrants. So 20% of that three million men were immigrants, foreign born. Of the three million that served, 400,000 of them were African Americans. Now, African Americans in 1917 were not just sprinkled throughout the military like every other ethnic group. They were segregated, meaning they were excluded from other organizations and then entirely excluded from the Navy and the Marines. They could only join the Army and be foot soldiers. What does the word segregated mean? Separated, separated or isolated from others. Most African-American soldiers were assigned to non-combat duties. What would be a non-combat duty in the Army? This is what the majority of African-American soldiers did. Cooks. Cooks and then worked in the kitchens. There were some exceptions. The all-black 369th Infantry saw more duty on the front lines than any other American regiment in World War I. Two of the soldiers even received uh, the cross of war from France's government. They didn't receive anything from the American government, which is basically one of the, high, the highest military honor that France can give. It's called the, the Croix de Guerre. I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak French very well. Cross of war. Okay, um, so once we, so once you're drafted, you know, we had about eight, no, I'm not saying they trained for eight months, but there was about an eight-month period that took place between your draft time to wartime, okay? And in this time, a lot of soldiers put in 17-hour days on the, on the target range and the practice, you know, drill, drill field where they learned skills on how to use their bayonets, how to shoot, how military life works, you know, how having a duty works, like you have a, a duty that you do. And um, real weapons were in short supply early in when, when the draft first happened. And so, much like in the Spanish American War, just 15, you know, six, seven, 18, 19 years earlier, sil soldiers often drilled with fake weapons. Like to learn to throw a grenade, they, they'd throw rocks, just throw rocks. Or they would use wooden poles or brooms to, as rifles to practice with. Again, this is in the 20th century. Okay, American military training with rocks and sticks. So uh, women were not allowed to enlist. Women were not allowed to enlist. But the army reluctantly accepted several women to serve in the Corps of Nurses, to be nurses, Army Corps of Nurses. However, when they did join the military, even though they were on the front lines with the, the men, they received uh, no rank, no pay, and no benefits. These ladies ready to go volunteer to serve on the front lines with no pay, no rank, and no benefits. That's pretty heroic. Um, there were about 13,000 women that had non-combat positions in the Navy and Marines, but they also served as nurses, secretaries, telephone operators. And they did receive rank, but not in the Army, only the Navy and Marines. So, this is how the United States raised an army, with the draft. And this, this is, these are the members who showed up, okay? You're basically uneducated. One in five of them were immigrants. Um, lower classes of society. That's who's showing up to go fight. Okay? But, right, so now we got you know, three million men drafted. We can't send them, send them into the trenches with broomsticks and rocks. So we're going to have to start making some stuff. And this is where you begin to see mass production really take hold in the United States. Industry strikes true. 
So in addition to the vast army that had to be created and trained, the United States had to find a way to transport the men, the food, and the equipment over thousands of miles of ocean. That's not an easy task. It's very difficult. It's an immense task. Made more difficult by the fact that the Germans had submarines that were blowing up every ship that they could find. So first the government, the, the, the government of the United States does some things to increase our production. This is what they do. The government exempted any shipyard worker from the draft. If you worked in a, in, a, in a job where you built ships and you were drafted, you were exempt. Why would they do this? That's right. They need as many boats as possible. And so you're, you're, you're actually serving the war cause by building the ships. So if you get drafted and you're a shipyard worker, you're exempt. You, you go to work. Okay? So it's called deferred classification. That's what that t- you just exempt from the draft. Second, um, in order to make everybody feel like you know buy into the war effort, the United States Chamber of Commerce started a public relations campaign to emphasize the importance of shipyard work. To kind of put shipyard workers like on a pedestal. They distributed service flags to families of, of shipyard worker, just like flags given to families of soldiers and sailors. A third thing that the United States did is they instituted prefabrication techniques. Do you guys know what prefab or prefabrication means? Okay, prefabrication, they do it today, they still do it today. It's very popular. They do it with houses today a lot. Like they'll build your house in a factory and then just deliver it in pieces. Like they'll build the entire wall, they'll build a whole wall in a factory and then deliver the wall and just set it up. And they can build an entire house in a day like like that. It's prefabrication. And so they begin to use prefabrication techniques. Instead of building an entire ship right in the shipyard, they'll just, you know, build build the parts of the ship elsewhere and assemble it in the yard. And if you have 50 different places that have each have you know specialized things that they do and they all bring their stuff at once, you can build a ship in a day. Or maybe even more than one. So this method reduces construction time considerably. In just one day, which was actually a holiday, July the 4th, the United States launched 95 new ships. 95 ships in a day. That's a lot. It's a lot by today's standards. A fourth thing the United States did, in addition to, you know, all these other things to increase our shipping capabilities, they also converted a lot of private ships and, and used them for transatlantic war. So they talked to people like Dole. Remember Dole? With the banana boats? Did the same thing. Like, hey, we're going to buy some of your banana boats and put machine guns on them. And that's what they did. They converted private vessels into uh, military vessels by just arming them. Okay? All right, so now we have our boats. We got three million men. We got to get them over there. We start sending them over there, and the Germans start blowing us up right before we can even arrive. So... Because German U-boat attacks on merchant ships in the Atlantic were such a serious threat to Americans and the Allied war effort, the United States began to employ what is known as the convoy system. A convoy system. You guys know what a convoy is? What's a convoy? You ever been driving on the interstate and you see like 85 big trucks in a row? Big, big semi-trucks, that's a convoy. So what a convoy is here with the convoy system is there's going to be large groups of ships, even merchant ships. And they're all going to be, you know, like all the the trade, like all the stuff that's just like food, they're going to be traveling with the military ships as well. Everybody travels together. That's the convoy system. You're going to have a heavy guard of destroyers and, you know, cruisers and everything, all the military ships, 
traveling with the merchant vessels. In doing so, this actually cuts the losses down significantly. The United States Navy also laid a 230 mile barrier of mines across the North Sea, which stretches from Scotland to Norway. Scotland to Norway. They're still there. Don't go submarining in the North Sea today. Kind of hard to get them off, you know, get them out. But the, this barrier was designed to keep the U-boats from you know, sailing out into the Atlantic Ocean. By, by early 1918, the Germans found it increasingly difficult to replace the losses that they were having. And of the 2 million Americans who sailed to Europe during the war, only 637 were lost at sea to U-boat attacks. So how could we describe the convoy system in terms of the mobilization of the American military to Europe? Was it successful or unsuccessful? It was successful. Okay. All right. So they get there. It's time to fight. And... After two and a half years of fighting, the Allied forces were exhausted and demoralized. And now all of a sudden you have brand new troops with brand new shiny guns and tanks and weapons and the American economy pushing it. And they arrive and that is really what turns the tide for the fighting in Europe. Not the American, you know, we always hear the stories of American bravery and heroic actions. Yeah, there was, there's a lot of that, but what really turns the tide is just the very fact that we joined, okay, in our, in our ability to outlast and help the Allies outlast the Central Powers. So, you know, apart from our numbers, our sheer numbers, but we also had an enthusiasm and a fresh and freshness. Uh, you know, you look here, this is a, an identification card. You, you, you may have heard of this man. His name's Edwin Hubble. You ever heard of him? You ever heard of the Hubble telescope? That's the guy. Okay, so um, once America, like it was, you were not part of the United States military once you arrived in Europe. You were part of what is known as the AEF, the American Expeditionary Force. That was what our fighting forces were called, you know, when we arrived. And the American Expeditionary Force was led by this man. And his name is General John Pershing. That is what the American forces were called. So whether you were Army, Air, no, there was no Air, Army or Marines, whatever, you were part of the AEF. This is your typical American infantryman. Do you know what the, they called American infantrymen during World War One? What their nickname was? Doughboys. They were called doughboys, just like dough, D-O-U-G-H, doughboys, like the Pillsbury doughboy. Why on earth would they call a soldier a doughboy? They'll never get it. It is believed that because they had these white belts, see the white belt? Um, in order to keep your belt looking nice and clean and white when you showed up for duty, it would, other than when you're you know, fighting in a hole, you would keep your, your, your canvas belt clean by using this pipe clay. It looked like dough. It was white in color. And you'd rub it on there and it'd make it look bright and white. And so they would always have their, their dough with them to keep their belts clean. And so therefore they got the name Dough Boys. All right? Um, most, most American infantrymen, most Dough Boys, they had never been out of their hometown or hollers or, or villages wherever they came from throughout the United States they'd never been even off their farms in some places so this imagine that and all of a sudden you're thousands of miles of home crossing the Atlantic Ocean and you're seeing the sights and sounds of Paris that made a pretty vivid impression in a lot of these young men's lives but 
Pretty soon, the, however, these doughboys are also shocked by the unexpected horrors, absolute horrors, on the battlefield and astonished by the new weapons and tactics that had been developed in this modern warfare. So let's take a look at some of those new weapons that evolved in World War I. The first ever modern war was the American Civil War. And there were some new technologies that emerged out of that. The usage of hot air balloons for reconnaissance, uh, Gatling guns, rifling of bullets. Those were some civil American Civil War advancements. By World War I, in, in, after the Industrial Revolution had, had hit, hit, hit largely, the battlefields of World War I were the first large-scale use of, of weapons that would become standard use in modern war. Uh, although some of these weapons were new, others like the machine gun had been refined to the point where it totally changes the nature of warfare. Yeah, in World, the Civil War, there was the Gatling gun where you'd pull a crank and it would shoot as fast as you could turn the crank. But by World War One, they had guns where you just pull a trigger and it's like a bullet hose. You know, it just shoots bullets as fast as you, you know, it can. So two other very innovative weapons that were first utilized in warfare were the tank. This is an American tank. And this is a guy by the name of George Patton standing in front of it, who becomes a general in World War II. But in World War I, he was a tank man. This is a German tank. Okay, Both sides had them. Also, the airplane. The airplane, first time, first time used, using it in warfare. Together, they heralded in the era of mechanized warfare, or warfare that relies on machines powered by gasoline and diesel engines. So tanks, as you can see, they ran on caterpillar treads, were built of steel. So what would happen when you shot one? Nothing. You know, it was bounced off. Uh, the British first used tanks in 1916 at the Battle of Somme. Remember that battle where 1.2 million people died? Um, they used them there. They just didn't use them very effectively. You know, it looked like a demolition derby kind of going on. That's not really an effective use of tanks. But by 1917, just a year later, the British had learned how to drive large numbers of tanks through barbed wire fences, thereby clearing a path for the infantry to come behind them and use it as cover, which is an appropriate use of tanks. Early airplanes were so flimsy that um, at first both sides, Allied and Central, just used them for scouting, just Kind of like a hot air balloon. We're just going to fly over and t take a look and see what's going on down there and fly back. After a while, both sides began to use tanks to fire enemy airplanes, but usually that was unsuccessful. And then eventually it, it, it merged into, you're going to send planes over to look at us? We're going to send planes up to shoot at your planes. Okay? Now... There were, they didn't have big machine guns mounted on them. They did at first, and they, they, they kept shooting their own planes. Like, I'm shooting, 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 and then all of a sudden I, shot, I shoot my own plane, and I'm going down. Okay? So early dogfights were more like duels. Like, you just go up, and I'm flying the plane, and I got a pistol, and I'm trying to fly the plane and shoot at your plane with a pistol. Usually you just crash because you're not paying attention. <laughs> so... Um, you know, those open cockpits would allow for the, the pilots to just shoot at each other. But because, it, you know, it made it very difficult to fly the plane. So, um, eventually the Germans inter introduced this thing that's called an interrupter gear. And it was, it was a gear that was attached to the propeller. And that gear would be attached to a machine gun. And when the pilot wanted, like, it would be mounted right on the front of the nose of the plane, right behind the propellers. And whenever the pilot wanted to shoot, like he could aim and still be flying the plane because he's looking straight ahead instead of trying to fly the plane like that, he would push the, the trigger down, but the bullets would, would, wouldn't go, th would, it would shoot through the whirring propeller blades because the interrupter gear would not allow, it would, the, the bullet, the gun would shoot at the rate of the propeller spinning. So that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty cool thing of engineering. 
It's like having a fan. You know, like put a fan on your desk and you shoot BBs through it. But it's done mechanically, so you never shoot your propeller blade. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can fire just a big stream of bullet through your through your propeller blades. Okay, so um, airplanes obviously by the end of the war got better and better and bigger and faster and stronger. And by the end of the war, they were able to carry bombs, big heavy bombs, which could be used to attack weapons factories, armies, and army bases. Observation balloons were also used, you know, hot air balloons. But, I mean, what kind of chance is a hot air balloon going to have against an airplane? You know, not, not much. Okay? All right, so these new weapons are going to cause for some new hazards for soldiers. Uh, you know, the, 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 the tactics and the weapons of World War I led to horrific injuries and hazards. Uh, in addition to simply living in a hole for months at a time, in a trench filled with filth and lice, body lice, rats, polluted water, and dealing with bouts of dysentery, um, they also would inhale poison gas. You would constantly be, be surrounded by the smell, the stench of rotting and decaying bodies. You did not sleep very much. You suffered from a lack of sleep. And constant bombardments and other experiences led to a battle condition known as, then, shell shock. Shell shock. And you can see a young man suffering from shell shock in this photograph here. Shell shock has, go has gone by many names throughout the history of American warfare. In World War I, it was shell shock. You can almost hear the sound of the, the weapons being fired. Shell shock. World War II, it became known as battle fatigue. Um, but but now, nowadays it goes by, what does it go by today? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, it, this is where your nervous system, your central nervous system, is pushed beyond the capabilities of the human brain. And you just have a breakdown. Like you, you are overwhelmed with so much stimulus and stress, you, your body and your brain can no longer handle it, and it has a variety of effects. It it it, tr it hits people in different ways. Some people shake uncontrollably. Some people lose their minds. Um, you know, and it's basically just a complete emotional collapse, and you don't always recover from it. There's no cure. Okay, it's a psychological condition. Not to mention all the physical hazards. You know, um, you see a bunch of some doughboys here being treated and checked for a very common condition called trench foot. Trench foot. This was caused by you know you get trench foot by standing in cold, wet trenches for long periods of time without changing your socks and shoes into dry socks and shoes. And it's pretty horror, horrific. First, your toes are going to turn color. They'll either turn red or blue. Then they would become numb. And you wouldn't feel them anymore, so you'd be like, oh, I guess I'm better. And then finally, because they're not getting proper circulation, they just rot off. Your feet will rot off. Okay? Which essentially would become gangrenous, and the only way to treat that is what? Amputation. Amputation. So and many soldiers lost their feet or toes, and others had to have their entire foot removed. Uh, there was also trench mouth, trench mouth, he had trench foot and trench mouth, which was very common among the soldiers. It was a, just an infection of your teeth and gums from being surrounded by filth and disgustingness for long periods of time. You're living in a hole with a bunch of other dudes, and everybody's using the bathroom in the same hole. You're going to get sick. Okay, you're going to get sick. So, um, very, very dangerous, hazardous conditions. All right. During this time, however, there were there are some accounts of unique American heroism. 
And this man on the right here is, is one, one such man. He is known today still as one of America's greatest war heroes. Anybody know who that is? His name is Sergeant Alvin York. Sergeant York. Anybody ever heard the name? Nobody? Well, Sergeant York is just an old hillbilly. He's a red-headed mountaineer from Tennessee. And when York was first drafted, he didn't want to go. He said, well, Bible says thou shalt not kill. I don't want to kill nobody. That's really what he said. He was a, he was a conscientious objector. There were a lot of people like Alvin York. A person who refuses, on moral grounds, to not participate in war. On more, not because he's scared, or not because he doesn't believe in the cause. He didn't want to kill anybody. Well, the United States government said, Too bad, York. Here's your gun. Good luck. So, eventually, York decided it was morally acceptable to fight if the cause was just. And while he was stationed in Europe on October the 8th, it's a good day, that's my birthday, 1918, armed only with a revolver and a rifle, York killed 25 Germans by himself with a revolver and a rifle. And then he, re he grouped up with six other American soldiers. So he and six other men captured 132 Germans. And he becomes a national celebrity. They make movies about him. He travels the, world, the United States doing... Bond drives, raising money for the war effort. They send him home, and he becomes a national celebrity. And he, he makes movies. They were silent, but still, he made movies. And he's a celebrity, Alvin York. Um, even General Pershing described G Alvin York's efforts as the greatest thing accomplished by any soldier in any army during the war. So... Uh, for his heroic acts, he's promoted to the rank of sergeant, which is an officer. He was not an officer. He was just a, pri like a, just a soldier. And uh, he becomes a celebrity when he returns to the United States. Alvin York. Okay. On November 3rd, 1918, things began to... I don't want to say slow down, but the war is coming to an end. Austria-Hungary surrenders to the Allies. That same day, November 3rd, 1918, German sailors began to mutiny. What does, that, what does the word mutiny mean? What's the word mutiny mean? What would happen if Devin started a mutiny in my classroom? What would happen? What did, what, what, describe for me what my classroom would be like if Devin started a mutiny. I would probably have my head cut off, and Devin would be teaching you history. Okay? Like, she's going to replace me, usually through violence. Okay? So German sailors began to mutiny against their government. I'm not fighting anymore. In fact, if you try to make me fight, I will kill you, officer. And this mutiny spread very quickly. And pretty soon, within a week, Germany's government collapsed and was replaced with a republic. You guys know what kind of government a republic is? You should. We are a republic. A government where 
the people choose representatives to represent them on their behalf. What was their government before? He's the Kaiser. What does Kaiser mean in German? Caesar, emperor. He was like, it was a monarchy. He was a single guy in charge. So Kaiser Wilhelm gives up his throne as king or emperor, and a republic takes charge. Even though no decisive battle had been fought, no amount of land, no, no, no conquering really took place. No Allied soldiers even set foot on German territory. Germany was never once even really invaded. Why is the war coming to an end? Exhaustion. The Germans were too exhausted to quit fighting. They were poor. They, 750,000 of them had starved to death from famine. They were exhausted. So, at the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, Germany signs an armistice. What's, what's the 11th day of the 11th month? What, what month is that? November 11th. What usually happens in America around that date? Veterans Day. And that's why we have Veterans Day in that part of November. Because of the armistice sign to end World War to end the fighting of World War One. Right, so the fighting ends. That is a truce, an armistice is signed. Essentially ending the fighting. But the Treaty of Versailles technically negotiates the peace. Okay? So let's look at the toll, the final toll of World War One. World War I was the bloodiest war in, in history up to that point. About 22 million people died between 1914 and 1918. 22 million. More than half of them were civilians. Most of the people that died were not soldiers. Civilians. From starvation, or a bomb dropping on your house, or you're just outright murdered by somebody. In addition to 22 million people dying, 20 million people were wounded. And 10 million people lost their homes and became refugees. The direct economic, direct, not indirect, like what would happen in the future, but the direct economic cost of World War I was about $340 billion of, World, of 1910's money. So trillions today. The United States' role, um, you know, we lost about 48,000 men in battle. About 62,000 men died of disease. Disease usually kills more than, more than bullets, honestly, in most wars. And about 200,000 Americans were wounded. So if you look at the, you know, the costs of World War I in the terms of life for, compared to other countries, I mean, look at Russia. You know, Nine million people die. That's almost half of all the deaths from one country. Okay? Then the, you know, the Germans, Austrian, Hungary, Hungarians all the way down to the United States. But even though the United States' casualties were low, the impact of the United States joining 
World War One was great because it allowed it allowed the Allies to outlast Germany. Because was Germany really defeated? Not really. They just they just ran out of oomph. They ran out of gasoline. They ran out of diesel. They couldn't have, they couldn't produce anymore. Everything had been destroyed. But the Allies had America. Keep keep the tanks coming. Keep the airplanes coming. We got Texas. We're gonna keep the oil coming. We're good. Okay. So um, uh, other yes, you know, we talked. I told you about these. So the costs very very high, very high costs, and that was World War One. Next time tomorrow we're gonna look at. The Treaty of Versailles, I believe. Actually, we're going to look at what life was like in America during the war. Don't hesitate to ask me.